we were uh, we looked at a little introduction to calculus of variations right and I think we saw one application which was the uh, shortest distance okay in a flat surface. The usual thing at this point would be that uh, in, cal in a course on calculus of variations the usual thing that you would do at this point is derive an expression for geodesics or something of that sort. Shortest distance for two points on the surface of a sphere, right? That would be the, that would be. So you can, you can easily pick up uh, some book and go through. Them. I mean, the derivations are pretty straightforward. It's all just calculus at that point. Okay, so I'm really not going to be doing that uh, today, since uh, the amount of time that I'm going to spend on this topic is really uh, not that much. We're only going to spend a few classes on it. I will. Uh, look at applications directly okay so just to first recollect right the for the problem so j of y is a a functional it takes a function as a, as an argument and returns a a number real number in this case okay so this is a this is a map just like our norms and so on even the norm took a function and returned a number you understand what i'm saying so we have seen this before and if you want an extremum for this if you want an extremum for this either a maxima or a minima then we saw that uh, you could take the first variation okay and to find out just so the, just to put it in context to find out whether it is a maxima or a minima if it were a regular function what would you do you would take the second derivative and check the sign in this case you would take something called the second variation which also I am not going to do in this class but I just, just as a piece of information right you have the first variation you can look at the second variation and so on so we are not going to look at the second variation you can go look up read up something on calculus of variation if you want to look at it. So you can set the first variation to 0 right and get the Euler Lagrange corresponding Euler Lagrange equation right which is what we derived in the last class we applied it to the shortest uh, path between two points in a two dimensional Euclidean in the plane of the blackboard in the two dimensional Euclidean plane okay fine okay. So can we do something interesting with this fine so I look at a simple problem first first in one dimension we will see what, what we get so consider this problem. So in this class I am going to mix my notation a bit so I want you to be a little careful okay I am going to use some kind of a mixed notation the subscript here means differentiation with respect to x yes I know I used prime here to mean differentiation with respect to x but in this case there was clear clarity it was clear you can say well even in this case it is clear but you will see that as we go along that there may be ambiguity so I choose to introduce this notation at this point right. So you will see me use both of these you will see me use. you will see me use both notations okay the subscript indicates differentiation with respect to whatever that parameter is is that fine. So what is the Euler Lagrange equation for this and if I am given so right, right and because like we said the paths the end points may be fixed you may be given u of a you may be given that you may be given those auxiliary conditions right just like I was saying earlier if I want to walk from your dining hall to this classroom then the end points are fixed the path may change but the end points are fixed so I have to prescribe those boundary conditions and the Euler Lagrange equation for this is dou f dou y dou in, in this case it is u with this notation just so that you see the chalk dust is just chalk dust right so this is.
okay. The Euler Lagrange equation will be that dou f dou u is 0 because it is not a function of u and only that is there and that gives me is that fine which is the 1D Laplace's equation, Laplace's equation in one dimension. Okay. So this problem minimizing, minimizing, extremizing, finding the extremum for this problem is the same as solving this, finding the extremum for this problem is the same as finding this, solving this. Okay. The big advantage so far it looks like other than the fact that you have to find the extremum, the big advantage here so far is there a difference between the two formulations are they identical? In a sense there is a difference, right here we are really not asking for the function, the candidate function to have a second derivative. We are not asking that the candidate function have a second derivative. I can substitute any path that has a first derivative defined. Okay, and I'm going to integrate. It. it can have finite number of continuities, countable number of. I won't say finite number, countable number of continu discontinuities. Whereas this requires that the second derivative exists. So there is a difference. It looks like there is a difference. This is seems to look look for solutions in a larger set of problems, and that then does this. Okay, is that fine? Okay, that's a, and that's something that's of interest. We will pay attention to that. Uh, that is something that is of interest. But okay, so I know how to solve this. How do we solve this numerically? Yesterday, what we did was we did an analytic solution. I knew there was an analytic solution, so I sought an analytic solution. Even this has an analytic solution because it's an ODE. But the point is not to use the fact that we know that it has an analytic solution. How would you solve it numerically? Okay, so recollect we defined. In the beginning of the semester, we defined hat functions. Maybe we'll use hat functions. You may be wondering, other than interpolating, for what purpose did we de define the hat functions? We'll try to use the hat functions, right? What were the hat functions? N i. What was its definition? Do you remember? Zero if uh, x less than x i minus one. X minus x i minus one. For something like that, I hope it's exactly. I hope the definition I'm giving is the same. This open and close. We have to be careful that we did it the same, but it doesn't matter. You can, you can check it out to make sure I'm being consistent. Okay, that was the definition. That was the definition, and of course, a small graph just to remind you. So that's i, i minus one, i plus one. The function looks like that. Okay, it's called the hat function. Just to recollect, and this value is one. This is x. That's n i. Okay. Right. So let's say the function u can be represented as u i and i. Okay, and clearly u zero will be from the boundary conditions. U zero will be u sub a and u capital N will be u sub b that is a given these are known these are known these were these boundary conditions were given okay so we will bear that in mind we will bear that in mind right now I am only looking for a general expression right when you you can you can work it out properly I am only looking for a general expression because I just want to give you a drift of how these things work okay. So what is do u do x? What is u sub x? And 
and do not get upset that I am using a prime here and a subscript there as I told you I am going to freely mix the notation right. It's, there is clarity here there is a reason why I am doing this you will see as we go along there is a reason why I am doing this right both of them are differentiation with respect to x there is no there is no confusion right now okay okay and as it turns out and I want this also that functional can be written indeed can be written as is that right one it is ux squared ux squared integral which is the same as this dot product right we happen to be fortunate at least for this example I happen to be fortunate that I am able to write it like this so I make use of that right because I want I want to keep life simple but otherwise actually it does not matter you would just substitute there you would just substitute there I just want to keep it you understand I am just making use of the fact that that worked out for me. So now what I want to do is I want to use so really I should not instead of saying u you remember I should actually say u h to indicate that it is an approximation where what is h h I will make it identical right for any i they are all equal equal intervals as I said in the beginning of the center, uh, semester in this class I am going to assume they are all equal intervals okay we can worry about non equal intervals elsewhere. So what is the approximation representation for the functional see now we can represent the functional the representation for the functional Okay, this is a point where you can make a mistake you have to be careful okay remember when you are using subscripts and you are doing these kinds of things you have to change the subscript when the second term comes along right this is a potential location for error. So I changed it to j this is a potential location for error. okay fine now in order to go on with this in order to go on with this so I this is just like this machinery will now just roll there is nothing it is just a matter of manipulation okay what we need to do is we know that we are going to get dot products of things like n i n j so we have worked this out before but we let us just look at it. So if this is n i if n i is defined in this fashion n prime i n prime i or j it does not matter equals what is it 0 if i less than x i minus 1 it is the slope is positive 1 by h if i is or x i whichever way I am sorry x less than I am going mad okay is that fine. Now we just take the dot product okay now we know this n i n j now we know now we just take the dot product prime i dotted with n prime j. So what does this give me what are the possibilities that we have see the, the graphs basically look like. The graphs basically look like that where this is the height 1 over h 
the graph basically looks like that okay so you can have the negative you can have the negative of the j you can have the negative that is j equals i minus 1 if j equals i minus 1 j equals i minus 1 what does the i minus 1 function look like let me take a different color chalk the i minus 1 function the derivative of the i minus 1 is this this is the derivative of ni this is the derivative of ni minus 1 they overlap only on this interval one is negative the other is positive so the product will gives me a minus 1 over h squared if I integrate one h will go away so it will give me minus 1 over h right so it is equal to 0 if j is less than i minus 1 right it uh, equals minus 1 over h if j equals i minus 1 equals well if it overlaps exactly j equals i then this is positive and that is positive because minus 1 by h into minus 1 by h is still 1 by h squared okay so there are two of them and the sign is positive so it becomes 2 by h j equals i and again minus 1 over h if j equals i plus 1 and 0 if j greater than i plus 1 fine we got the dot product so in this summation in this summation the summation of j the summation of j the only sensible values of j that we take are j is i minus 1 i and i plus 1 all the other dot all the other dot products are 0 is that fine is that okay the only only terms that we take are i i minus 1 i i plus 1 right so in fact i could replace that i can i can maybe i'll rewrite it it's okay so i can rewrite that now right i can rewrite that as h u h equals half sometimes writing it that bit has its consequence okay let me try that out again one more time u of h u of h is one half Is that fine? Okay. Please. It minus one by Where where is that? I'm sorry. Which one? It is minus one by x square. No, 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 but you are going to integrate. So you'll you'll get the kind of a thing. Zero. It's essentially zero to h. that is what you get. So this will this will give you a x dx by h squared x i minus 1 to x i. So that x i plus 1 that will give you an extra h is that fine okay okay yeah. So we come back here uh, clearly I can take the summation out okay. So this is going to turn out to be or I can write it at, as uh, three terms. So this is going to turn out to be one half I can write it as 1 by 2h I think fine I can factor out the h also 1 by 2h summation i equals right now I will write it from 1 through n minus 1 I will write it from 1 through n minus 1 
okay because I know the first point and the last point are basically boundary conditions. Uh, the first interior point will also have a boundary condition in it but I am not going to take care of that right now okay right just to indicate to you that boundary conditions have to be taken into account I will only remove the first and last points. So what does this give me ui ui minus 1 what is the dot product of n prime i and n prime i minus 1 minus 1 by h minus 1 by h so that is a minus sign there is an h there okay plus ui squared and there are two of them because that was 2 by h n i prime dot n i prime u i n i prime dot u i n i prime that gives you n i prime dot n i prime which was 2 divided by h okay. So 2 u i squared plus what is the last one or minus rather u i u i plus 1 and plus there will be these as I said boundary conditions which will be like u a squared by 2 h plus u b squared by 2 h and so on okay there will be two terms two extra terms for either either end okay which I have just knocked out I mean I could have left it in there but I just I just took it out just to show you that they will come out remember that when i equals 1 this u i minus 1 will be u a and when i equals n minus 1 this u i plus 1 will be u b okay just bear that in mind okay the boundary condition is still there it has not disappeared okay now what differentiate and set it equal to 0 that will be easier all of it within the summation equals 0. Do I forget something? Oh that is 4, thank you, that is 4. Now you have to ask the question what happens when, when, when yeah what, what, which, which works, which is, how does it work? So what happens when I equal, what happens to these things when I not equal to j it is obviously 0 right when I equals j this is obviously so if I am differentiating it with respect to j you have to figure out all the ones when this is when this is i am I making sense yeah your question. Yeah, that is why I mean that is what I was saying when i equals 1 you are back here in this line when i equals 1 if this is u1 this will be ua and when i equals n n minus 1 ui plus 1 will be ub you have to take care of that I mean I am not writing that then I would have to write it from 2 to n minus 1 and write a linear term these are product terms there will be two linear terms and then there is this two first order terms and Right. We are not considering uh, ua in 0 prime. No, no, listen to what I am saying. So you can write it 2 to n minus 1 and then you will get a u1 times ua. When i equals 1, you have to do something special, that is what I said earlier, 
when i equals 1 you have to do something special when i equals uh, with this term when i equals n minus 1 you have to do something special u i plus 1 will be u b no the summation if you you can write it as a summation going from 2 to n minus 2 and this just like i wrote these two secular terms you will have two other terms which will be u1 ua un minus 1 ub and it's not clear from your face it's not clear whether you understand what i'm saying or not just write out the summation yeah you are talking about this one yeah. So first, we are taking the dot product of u from i i equal to one to n minus one. With but the u's don't figure in the dot product. They're only they're only with uh, they're only they only work with the uh, the ni's. Their functions are ni's. The u's are just coefficients. Yeah, but then we take the m zero and or m m dot product. That will be this function. Only the first one n1, n0, n0 will be non-zero, all the others will be 0. n0, uh, yeah, n0, n1 will be the one that I am talking about here, which will give me u1, ua. But shouldn't there be another n0, n1 term? Because n1, when you take the dot there can't be. How can there be? How, how is it possible? You take one of each one of these. I and J and J and I are we have to consider them separately. There is only one summation now. Yeah, it is not a double summation anymore. We removed the other summation. We removed the other summation. I opened out the other summation. Yeah. This is the other summation. Yeah. This is the other summation. No, these are the actual terms. These are the actual terms. So when I, mean, when I is one, we have a zero term on the right hand side. But when yeah. I is zero, we have a one term on the right hand side. So when I is one when i is 1 when i is 1 we will have a 0 n0 oh, you are term saying i will have an n minus 1 term here i have an n0 term here is that what you are saying and then when i is 0 you will have a you will not have a n minus 1 term but you will have an n do all of them duplicate that means you are saying this is half goes away all of them will duplicate all of them will duplicate <laughs> So this coefficient which I am anyway, I guess I got away with it so far because I always set it equal to 0. Is that fine? You are saying that when this, when i equals 1 here, this is n i minus 1 which is n 0 and when i equals 0 here you have a uh, n 0 here but then what n i minus 1 does not exist, n i n i minus 1 does not exist but when i equals 1 but you do not get another n i minus 1, n i minus 1, you get only 1 n i minus 1, n i minus 1. There will be only one, all the others there will be two, and that is going to show up here actually. But then the, N, I, but then the 0 1, like N0, N1 terms show up only once in the, in the next line. It does not matter, you can actually evaluate this term and you will see that it should come out the same way. Does not it come out the same way? No, we should add another 0 1 term on the, in the, in the outside the summation part. Oh, here? Yeah. There will be because two of that, these. That u a square by two h is coming from n zero dotted with the whole summation. There's a zero term here. There's a zero term here. When we take n zero, we'll have an n. No, if you take i equals one. Which part you are? If you take i equals one. See, this half multiplies only the summation. Anyway, we work it out. I think you are. I don't. I don't want to. We are. We are. We are. We are already five minutes into this. Uh, so what we will do is now since we have had this uh, discussion you can check out this these coefficients set this equal to 0 you will now pull the plug on this uh, whatever right so we will work it out so you can work out the details there I think that is something because this counting you always have to be careful so right so you can work out the details of you can it is a matter of counting fine. So you have to make sure that you count right but I will do it in a different fashion because I want to as I said let me let me do j of h the same thing if we were not talking about hat functions and this is the reason why this doubling occurs that you are talking about. 
So, to give you a, uh, an insight into where possibly the doubling occurs, let me give you a summation i equals uh, let me see 1 1 through n ui minus ui minus 1 squared by 8 squared. Is that okay? We did hat functions first, then we did Taylor series representations of derivatives directly, right? So u sub x is ui minus ui minus 1 divided by h, right? This was the other, this is this, this is the other representation that we had u, u, ui ui minus 1 at h. Am I making sense? This is the other representation that we had. So you can differentiate this dou j dou u can do the same thing or we can I will cheat n and what does this give me? You have to be a bit careful here, okay. Normally I would do it with j because I want to be careful but today I am going to we will push it slightly. So what do, you have? what do you have here? You have 2 ui, ui minus 1 times 1 divided by h squared. Anything else? Plus when i is, when i is i plus 1 you have to shift it, right. That is why I said you are doing, doing, doing it by j is easier. If you are if you are differentiating with respect to two for do u two for instance u two, then when i i is two this is u two, when i is three this is u two, this will contribute. Plus, what does it give me? U i plus one minus two u i. Two of those. Into a minus one. Plus, is there any plus? Fine. Okay. So this gives me what? If I set this equal to zero, so this is not. There is no. There is, actually, there is no summation here anymore. So if I set this equal to zero, what do I get? Actually, even there, there is no summation anymore. But it doesn't matter. We'll get back. We'll get back to this. If I, where, what, what do we get? Two ui plus one, minus two ui. Two ui plus one, minus two ui minus one. So you get minus two ui plus one, plus four ui, minus two ui minus one, divided by h squared. Of course, there's a one half outside. So one half outside. So one half outside. And I set it equal to zero. This is really the point that I was trying to get to. It. Then you're fine. Okay. So effectively, you get the discretization. You get the discretization of, which is the representation of uxx equals zero. Am I making sense? It's the representation of uxx equals zero. Okay. Okay. So all of this was leading somewhere. Let's see where it goes. That's in one dimension. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly do this. So, if you have uxx equals zero or uxx equals f for whatever it is, you can. There is a there is a game that uh, what do you call it that we play. That's one way. This is calculus of variations part. I'm going to take uh, come back to the calculus of variations part, but I won't take a slight detour before I. I won't take a small detour before I go there. Okay. So, le, we can choose any other any other functions instead of choosing. I chose n here being hat functions. But it could have been n0, n1, n2 corresponding to quadratics or n0, n1, n2, n3 corresponding to cubics. We have done higher order representations also. Just so that we do not get confused with that, I will change the, uh, 
basis functions may be to say something like b okay and b has enough derivatives for me to do whatever it is that I am going to do now. So what am I going to do now? I have uxx equals 0 or uxx equals f whatever. I can project this equation directly onto these functions okay. So I basically say that uxx dotted with b, I project that right, I project this operator onto this. Fine. So what does this turn out to be integral? This is a dot product, but this actually is uxx b dx on the interval a b, and that's supposed to be zero. Now I'll do integration by parts. Integration by parts gives me You understand when I said b has enough derivatives okay that is what I meant I am going to differentiate b. So I can do integration by parts one more if you want once more right I can do integration by parts one more time. So you get Is that fine? Is that fine? Right? All I am doing is integration by parts. So if b is sufficiently smooth, I can transfer those derivatives, and again, like we did earlier. So there, I did it as a variational problem, like we did earlier. The uh, how should I put it? The uh, requirement on the number of derivatives on u has now decreased. The smoother I take my b, the less derivatives I need to insist on my u. The smoother I take my b, the less derivatives I need to insist on my u. Am I making sense? Okay, you can admit a larger class of solutions. So if you are talking about say something like uh, wave equation, nonlinear wave equation, wave equation where you can have a step function. You cannot substitute it into the differential equation and check whether it is a solution or not because you cannot take the derivatives okay. Whereas in a formulation like this you can actually substitute it in and if your b is 0 at a and at the end points that term goes away anyway. If your b you understand if the b's are 0's at the end points that term goes away anyway or you can choose it so that something happens to bx I mean it is up to you how you apply the boundary conditions right. So it actually turns out that. So this the, the u that you get could satisfy this but you may not be even able to verify whether that, that is true or not. You may, it may not have a derivative. If it has a shock it does not even have a derivative right. At the beginning of the semester I said wait a minute here we have, we have dou u dou t dou u dou t plus u dou u dou x equals 0 even though we gave it smooth initial conditions the discontinuity appeared as part of the solution. Then the question was how do I substitute it back if there is a discontinuity I cannot differentiate. So in the classical sense is it a solution the question does not make sense whereas if you were to convert it into something of this form you could still ask that question and answer it okay right. Uh, this is just for lingo just to get the jargon right. So a solution to this is called a weak solution this is a weak formulation and a weak solution weak formulation. Okay, fine. Let us get back. This is just as I said, this is just an aside. Let us just get back to calculus of variations. What if it were in multiple dimensions? You should have suspected when I went to the notation u sub x that it, I am talking, I am going to talk about multiple dimensions, right? Obviously. So, what if it is in multiple dimensions? So, it is in 2D. So, the independent variables are x and y. Okay. So, j of u. Over some domain D, right? So, this is something of the form of 
something of that form and I am not going to derive the Euler Lagrange equation I am going to just squint at the earlier one and write it out right. So it is likely to be okay is that fine okay now you know why I went to the subscript form formulation the form notation. So if you use this what happens to this this becomes 2D Laplace's equation right this becomes 2D Laplace's equation. So you have a variational representation of 2D Laplace's equation and this will correspond to this will give you Laplace's equation directly this is the variational form. So when we are solving Laplace's equation I basically said that look solving Ax equals b for Laplace's equation was the same as minimizing something solving Laplace's equation the differential equation is equivalent to minimizing that this is a continuous equivalent I showed you a discrete equivalent earlier discrete version earlier right saying that if A was symmetric that Q of x equals one half x transpose ax you remember this is x transpose b minimizing this q of x right minimizing this q of x was the same as solving the system of equations ax equals b where a was symmetric we showed this this is the this is the analog okay so uh, solving this is the same as minimizing that am I making sense okay we are sort of tied that tied tied the two together so this the so if you were to discretize this or you were to discretize that you would suspect that there is a discretization that will get you the same in both of them right which is what we did in one dimension am I making sense is that clear. So there are times when doing this is there are times when uh, doing the variational form is easier than doing the differential form. You may look at Laplace's equation and say wait a minute I say I am giving you Laplace equation as an example you could look at it and say that it is just averaging of the 4 why, the, why should I go to an op minimization problem minimization problem looks more difficult right but that is because it is Laplace's equation okay so what if it were a different problem so I will just write out the equation for a different problem just a slightly messier problem consider this J of u. you know what this integral is surface area right if u is the surface this is the surface area right this was the length of a curve this is the surface area okay. So if you were to minimize this you will get a minimal surface this so this is a typical soap bubble right you take a wire frame of some kind stick it into soap water take it out a film forms on it you want to know what is the surface what is the area what I mean what is the function and uh, because the thickness is almost 0 you can equivalently tie the energy in that system to the area and so minimizing the area is like minimizing the total energy right. So you can you can actually tie the two together tie the two together and it turns out that this minimal surface uh, problem as it is called is a very classic problem it is a classical problem a lot of people have studied it the equivalent differential equation if you want so just to discourage you to, to give you to encourage you to think of variational problems occasionally is this. You are wondering why do I remember this because it has a nice pattern to it right. That is a messy differential equation that is not Laplace's equation you understand what I am saying this is a pain to discretize this is a pain to discretize this this works right this is this I would rather I would rather really discretize this and throw it on some kind of an optimization problem there are still there are still issues right there are still issues with respect to this we do not really have the time to discuss it but I would rather discretize this rather than set up the differential equation set up the discrete equations that come from this am I making sense is that okay. 
So, I would rather write a function that evaluates this and then say hang a an optimization routine on top of it and let it go through the optimization process blindly as though it is a black box and come up with a solution rather than actually working out the differential equation that comes out the discrete equation that nonlinear discrete is a system of equation right algebraic nonlinear algebraic equation that you get n dimensional nonlinear algebraic equation that is a mess and in order to solve it anyway you will have to do some kind of a Newton method or whatever it is and then you are com committed in this optimization context to a steepest descent or something of that sort. Right. So, instead of going there go directly to the optimization problem, it is easier to formulate right. So, the variational the variational techniques have a place. So far Laplace's equation problems that you have never seen before in this class how does it fit with respect to solving the Euler equations or Navier-Stokes equations or what how would you do this with respect to these schemes. Well one is you could follow this path right you could follow this path you could uh, and that could be done in various ways one possible way would be that you take r which is the residue r is the residue of whatever equation that you are solving see right now I am talking about it in a very general context r is the residue. So, you can take r and your basis functions and try to set that equal to 0 right you could go through that process a generic situation. Am I making sense? R dot B will give you R dot B will give you the components that go with this. The other possibility is that you could look at what is this? It looks like the norm of R, it looks like the norm of R, and you could try to minimize this or set it equal to 0, right? You minimize this you minimize this so now I have a functional again I have a functional representation you minimize this if this r is minimized if, if this r is minimized okay you have a variational formulation now this could be Navier-Stokes equations or it could be Euler equations it could be any form uh, of course there are special techniques the whole class of special techniques if you are talking about uh, upwinding and so on. Right. So, I do not want to go there there are special things that you have to do if you want to get into this business of upwinding. But if you leave that if you leave that out for further research for you guys to do later. So, what you could basically do is without see without even writing the differential equation. So, if you have a generic differential equation and r is the residue you could write the expression for r take r dot r and minimize it am I making sense and within within round off error you should be able to get the minimize it to you should be able to find the minimum you actually want it to be 0 because it is a residue right you actually want it to be 0 and this could be minimized. So, we have the pro generating a variational problem is relatively easy generating a variational problem is relatively easy. If you want to generate a variational problem directly from let us go back to u x x equals p if you want to gen generate a variational problem directly from the differential equation one way to do it is do it this way but what if you wanted to go act as though this is the Euler Lagrange equation of some other equation of some variational form what is that variational form how do you find that I have picked something easy here right I have picked something easy here what I have picked basically is if you take ux squared by 2. Okay, if you take something like this, it works. I picked something easy. How do you can ask me the question? How did you get this? Well, I guessed it, just like all other integration. I thought about it. I said I wanted dou f dou u to be p, so it should be p times u. Okay, right? Fine. The only derivative for which there's a headache, it is a problem, is the first derivative. So the first derivative. If you have a first derivative here. that is a problem as always those first derivatives are a headache okay right. So, I think that uh, that uh, about covers what I want to say about uh, variational techniques that indexing thing is something that we need to all right we can just check out I will see whether 
one day I come back with a correction or I will just leave it for you guys to fix it. Is that fine? Okay. Thank you.